कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी करती है मुलाकातें कभी यादों में बरसाते किताबें करती है बातें किताबें करती है बातें मन की गहरी झील में कूद जाती हैं कभी सोच के दरिया के संग संग बहती जाती हैं कभी चाहे शाम हो या हो रातें किताबें करती हैं Welcome to Kitab Nama, Books and Beyond. I'm here with Mihir Sharma, the author of Restart, The Last Chance for the Indian Economy. We're going to be discussing this book today. Mihir, let's begin. So Mihir, you say in the book that the Indian economy is like an old bus. Can you explain what you mean by that? It means that I think in, it was sort of constructed in the 1950s and 60s. It was built up of um, socialist dreams and uh, slightly out of date technology. It's been made to run along the same roads that it has for about 40 years without you know, m much change in its habits. And off late, it's been held together with, um, by enthusiasm and rubber bands more than anything else. So that's like a lot of buses that we have on the roads of this country, I think. You refer to the period of growth in the first decade of this century uh, by saying that it turns out the bus was only rolling downhill. <laughs> yes, I think that we have to realize that our great years of growth were essentially um, not, not because our, the engine of our growth was working too well, but because you know, we had, to use another meta, fa a metaphor, favorable winds. We had something that was pushing us forward or pulling us forward, and not because of the internal momentum of the economy itself. Uh, so you say in the beginning of the book that the problems facing the Indian economy are quite similar to the problems facing all emerging market economies. Can you talk about what kind of problems each of these emerging market countries faces that are similar to those of India? The first is that in the big boom years of, of the 2000s, when there was a lot of money floating around the world because of uh, you know, Wall Street was booming, and even in the years after the crash, when the, the US Federal Reserve pumped a lot of money into the economy, all these emerging markets felt a lot richer than they actually were. So they started spending on, sometimes on social sector services that they couldn't immediately afford. In um, other cases, they built grandiose infrastructure projects and then discovered they didn't quite have the mechanisms in place to prevent corruption and misuse of those funds. What happened, therefore, was that when the money dried up and the West stopped financing our dreams in many cases, we discovered that they were built on corruption, lies, expectations that were never going to be fulfilled. In Thailand, for example, you had a promise of free rice and that's something that it turns out the government can no longer afford and as a consequence there are major political protests. And there have been similar problems in a lot of other parts of the world. And it's for, important for us in India to recognize that what we are going through is not something that is unique to us. And so then now, what are the problems that are unique specifically to the Indian economy? The answer to that is very simple. It is our very, very specific laws regulating the movement of workers from one factory to, to another, regulating the sale and purchase of land. You know, the fascinating thing is that India and Bangladesh, for example, have pretty similar laws, pretty similar cultures, pretty similar conditions. Is, uh, Bangladesh has a really, really flourishing textile industry, whereas India's is struggling. The only difference between India and Bangladesh there is that after partition, India introduced a bunch of additional restrictive laws on factories that mean that our factories can't grow to the size that Bangladesh's textile factories are. Now, I'm not saying Bangladesh's textile factories are perfect. They have lots of problems. In fact, they are probably not as well regulated as they should be. But India's are perhaps too well regulated. And that is the case with, that, that is what makes us special. We have a tiny manufacturing sector as compared to absolutely every other country in the world. So you mentioned in the book these very restrictive laws. But you also talk, for example, about how 
India has a sort of second class infrastructure in part because there's a cultural legacy that looks at overspending on infrastructure or on comfort as a kind of indulgence. Are there other cultural legacies at play here? There are three or four things that I think we can point to as being most obviously the product of cultural forces. One of them is kind of odd. It's not just the fact that we have restrictive laws that stop our factories from growing. It's also the, ca the case that many people don't want to work with their hands in factories. There's a story from the late uh, 19th century about how people studied some factory floors in, in Bombay when uh, it used to be the, a textile manufacturing hub. And they found that mostly they were integrated, except for places where workers had to touch. And then they found that caste, that entire factories are segregated by, uh, uh, by caste. I think that even more than that, there is a, a prejudice against manual labor in our, in our culture that causes us to seek out service jobs rather than to work on a shop floor. You know, we would rather be a receptionist sitting down in what is a practically an unskilled job than go on um, a shop floor and do actual work. We see this even in IITs. I mention in the book about how my father, when he was in the IITs, uh, when he graduated from the IIT in the, early, in the late 1960s, um, wanted to go and work on a shop floor. But that's very, very rare. It's very, very rare for an actual engineer a government-trained engineer to go out and work in a factory anymore, although that is precisely why the IITs were set up by Nehru. Uh, similarly, you talk about how politicians have tended, uh, after Gandhiji, to encourage people to stay in villages rather than allowing them or encouraging them to move to where jobs are. Yes, I think that Gandhiji has a lot to answer for, uh, and of course he's a lot, he did a lot, but there's a, there are a lot of ways in which we pay uh, we, we, we honor his memory by maybe making people worse off in a way that he would not have countenanced if he was still alive. One of those is by saying that, and this is typically people who live in cities saying this, um, that Indian village life is somehow perfect. And it, even if it's not perfect, it is sacred. It needs to be preserved. It has some inherent quality of Indianness that we in the cities have lost, have forgotten, we do not have access to. This is not something that in my experience, most people who grew up in, in villages actually agree with. If, it, if they did agree with it, they wouldn't be moving to cities at the rate of uh, you know, millions a year. By some estimates, one third of India has left the village that they, uh, the, the place that they were born, and which is a truly extraordinary statistic. And yes, I think that people do this because in the traditional Indian village, you are restricted to your, the occupation frequently that you were born with. If not, you struggle to make a mark in farming, which is a largely unprofitable exercise. One third of Indian farming, only one third of Indian farmers make enough money from farming to live on. Two thirds of them have to go outside, have to come to the city for three months of the year to become construction workers. So there's something deeply wrong with forcing people to stay in the villages. So how, one of the things you argue in the book broadly is that we need a transition from, particularly outside of the cities, a predominantly agricultural workforce to a predominantly industrial or manufacturing workforce. How might that transition be catalyzed by a government? I think one of the big ways in which you can do that is, is something that the government is actually working on, which is the Aadhaar program. People stay in their villages because it's only in the villages that you exist as a person. You only exist as a person in the place that you were born. That is where every, every time you want to get anything out of the government in this country, they ask for your place of birth, they ask for some kind of documentation that says, this is where this man or this woman lives. What we need to do is to take that requirement away. We should be able to let people move from place X to place Y and still have access to subsidized food, to health care to whatever else the government wants to give them on the basis of their citizenship. And I think that we have for, for too long avoided doing this. In your view, why is manufacturing the essential thing that needs to be rebuilt? First, there's the question of history. It's very difficult to find examples, in fact, I have been able to find examples of countries 
which have moved from poverty to being generally middle class without there being a mass manufacturing sector. You need to be able to employ people in factories, give them the kind of security that a solid manufacturing job provides if they are to ri ri rise above the poverty in which they were born. This is how England developed, it is how much of Western Europe developed, it is how America developed, it is how Japan developed, it is now how China became the middle income country that it is today. There are very few alternative paths that we can think of theoretically and there are no alternative paths that we can point to in practice. So there's that. There's also the additional intangible benefit of factories. And this is something that is hard to pin down but there are, in factories you are organized according to your profession. You select anyone you want to, who wants to work on the, on, on the shop floor and then they work with people from different parts of the country, from different backgrounds and they eventually develop a certain sense of solidarity with the people who are doing the same work. In an economy that is based around, let's say, small shops, family-run enterprises, the kind that we have right now, informal networks of caste, class, family, patronage continue to play a much larger role in where and how you, you get to work and how you you rise in the world. If you want to break down those things, if you want an economy that helps break down those things, a manufacturing economy really helps. So after all of these years, how is it possible if everyone knows that these laws are an impediment to economic growth, nothing has ever been done to clear them away? I think that we, we got these laws at various points in our history. I think the, for example, the Factories Act was in the late 1870s. There's a Boilers Act from the 1890s after one boiler exploded in North Bombay and an act was passed and now every establishment with a geezer even needs to have a boiler inspection and a boiler register. Um, we had further labor standards introduced in the 1920s. We had restrictive uh, uh, fact employment legislation introduced in the 50s and the 70s and again, in fact, in the early 1980s. So it is quite extraordinary that at every point in India's history, we have always added on to our restrictions on enterprise. We have never replaced those restrictions. We have never improved on them. We have never made, rewritten them. They've always just been added on. And why is it that you can't take any of them away? Well, I think it's partly because we've never had people who care about, about factories or entrepreneurship in positions of power in this country. Um, Jawaharlal Nehru, for example, had, you know, for all his many virtues, always thought that factories should really be run by the public sector. They should really be something the government is doing because the government does it better than capitalists. And, you know, it didn't matter what regulations you put into place because if the government is the employer, things are fine anyway, just slap on any re regulation you want on the private sector. Um, subsequently, you had people who used regulations as tools in order to keep capitalists coming to them for favors, you know, heart, you know, with their hands folded in supplication. And in the last 20 years, when even that has been chipped away, I think we've just been lazy. We've just been a little scared of actually doing the hard work of reforming what has now become an almost unimaginably complicated structure of legal regulations. So if we go back to 1991 and the passage of the so-called first generation reforms, can you talk about what was done right in 1991 and what was done wrong in 1991? What they did right in 1991 was to essentially fix what people could buy and when and from where and from whom. In, in the grey India of the 1980s, which it is possible a lot of people watching not only do not remember but cannot imagine. It was impossible to buy tablecloths that were distinctive from the tablecloths that you would find in your friends' houses. We all wore similar shoes, we wore similar clothes, you know, we didn't really have spectacle frames that looked different from each other. In, so in that grey India of the 1980s, you basically had no control over what people were producing. And the wonderful thing that we did in, the 19, in, the, in 1991 was to change 
was to, was to open up, was to free the Indian consumer and to free the Indian producer. Those two people could not now start talking to each other without the government coming in the middle. Somebody, peep, somebody making something and somebody buying something could now talk to each other. What we did not do was free up another set of relationships, that between the people who were making something and the people they, and things that they would employ. Okay, I would not free up the relationship between the employer and the employee. I wouldn't free up the relationship between the borrower and the lender. That relationship still had the government sitting in the middle as a kind of middleman. And that was what 1991 failed to do, and that's what we need to start doing now, or we will continue to struggle. One of the legacies of Narasimha Rao that you mention is that he bequeathed a kind of political cowardice to future politicians when it came to standing up and defending economic reform. Rao was a very, very reluctant reformer. I mean, it's possible to say he wasn't a reformer at all. He was just doing what he thought was necessary at that point in time, necessary to stave off total destruction of the economy, national humiliation. He used various different you know, phrases for the gravity of the situation. The moment that the immediate problem went away, he said, okay, now we'll stop doing it. And even when reforms were being put into place, only the finance minister then, Manmohan Singh, was willing to say, yes, these are new things that we are doing. Rao himself, whenever he talked about the reform process, would say, look, this is actually exactly what Rajiv Gandhi would have done if he was still around. Remember, Rajiv Gandhi had just been assassinated. In fact, he would go further and said, you know, this is what Nehru would have done. This is what Indra would have done. And we have just failed to say that, yes, we made mistakes for 50 years or for 45 years, and those mistakes were not, may have been in the best of, uh, may have been made with the best of intentions, but we want to reverse them, we want to fix them. You talk about how uh, Rao in particular was struck by a sort of fear of appearing treasonous, and you write that all politicians have inherited from him the ability to attribute every electoral reversal to economic reforms. I think the there were a series of sort of high profile elections even while Rao was around that first terrified Rao. He lost his home state of Andhra Pradesh in the mid 1990s and in the middle of his term, sorry. And that's exactly when he began to roll back reform. You know, it wasn't because he was politically weak at the center. In fact, at the same time he began to stop reforming, he managed to cobble together a working majority in parliament. He could have increased the pace of the reform process, he shut it down instead. And that was because he thought he'd lost Andhra Pradesh on the back of economic reform. There wasn't actually any real data, any real reason for him to suppose that. There weren't even that many people telling him that. But he feared because he was always convinced that the reform process was something that was top down, that that was why. Then he lost the general election. And that told everyone that, look, if Rao's government reformed and lost the general election, we are in trouble. And finally, there was the great example of Chandra Babu Naidu, right. who was the first chief minister, I think, in this country, the first major politician, to stand up and say, yes, I am a reformer. I will welcome you know, new ideas. I will welcome new investment. I will talk to the World Bank. I believe in computers. People will move to the cities. He said all these things. And then he lost. And people were shocked. People were dismayed. And people assume that it was because of reform. Now, it may not have been because of reform at all. It may just have been because there was a terrible drought in the year before the Andhra Pradesh elections, and Chandra Babu Naidu just wasn't efficient enough in responding to it. We now have a new government, which came into office in May, which I think could be fairly described as having a thundering mandate for economic change. What's stopping them from making these big reforms? I think they are not quite certain what kind of moves they want to make. Maybe they'll find their way eventually. They promised change, they never gave us the details. They're slowly coming to terms with how, how much needs to change. I think um, the Prime Minister's Make in India policy, which is essentially a focus on manufacturing, where he recognizes the, the benefits that manufacturing could provide. I think that that's an important first step. And at some point, the, the government will realize that in order to build a manufacturing sector, there are major changes to administration, there are changes to the leg, uh, re legal and regulatory system that will have to be carried out.
and that can happen at any time. So in your view, if you were to go and say brief the finance ministry on what you think needs to be done, what are the three most important steps that could be taken to restart the economy? I think the first is work on, on liberalizing labor, uh, labor law. Don't make it easy to fire workers, but make it possible to fire workers. That's all you actually need to do, all right? The second is work on bankruptcy law. It should be possible for people who own companies, if those companies are not working, to take their money out of those companies and put them in other companies. Currently, even that is not pos possible. And the third is work on a real market for land. I don't mean land acquisition, all right? I don't just mean land acquisition. It should be possible for farmers to sell land to industrialists directly. That still doesn't happen. We have problems because farmers have to sell through somebody else to industrialists. Farmers should be able to sell them directly and then both them and the industrialists will benefit. Thank you, Mihir, for being with us on Kitab Nama. The book again is Restart, The Last Chance for the Indian Economy by Mihir Sharma. Thank you, Sharma. This is taken from my book, The Hemlock Cup, Socrates, Athens and the Search for the Good Life, which was really a, a book that tried to get to the heart of Socrates the man as well as his philosophy. I'm reading here from a short chapter which talks about the religious environment in which Socrates was tried and then condemned to death. He died by drinking a little cup of hemlock poison in his cell 24 centuries ago. The first blood sacrifice. A religious law court, Athens, May 399 BC. If you think that by killing people you'll put a stop to anyone criticising you because you don't live as you should, you're not thinking clearly. The best and easiest course is not to restrain others, but instead to do what you need to do to be as good as possible. Socrates in Plato's Apology, 39D. A blood sacrifice started the legalities in earnest. Today, the oath stone is the only thing that feels secure in the boggy rectangle of the old religious court, the Stoa Basileus. Archaeologists have to lay planks to cross safely. Marshy grass clumps around the few marooned classical remains and a rude train from the leafy suburb of Caphysia to Phraeus rattles by at four minute intervals. This stone block a limestone table for sealing sacred oaths rests 20 feet below today's street level. Overhead, tourists munch Greek salads above the masonry blocks and fallen columns here in the fashionable placard district. They are seemingly unaware of the drama that once played out beneath them. Because, as Socrates watched in 399 BC, this cracked, worn, six foot long altar block would have gleamed with blood and gore. The theatre of justice had begun. The Archon Basileus, the chief magistrate, his hair long and wreathed in myrtle, his tunic unbelted, did the killing. The oath sworn here was believed to be binding, its potency accentuated by the visceral nature of the sacrifice. Goats, rams or oxen, their coats washed and scented, horns twinkling with guilt were coaxed to the priest's blade. As they died, the animals opened veins coursed into a sacred bowl and here the magistrate plunged his hands. Wrist deep now in blood, he was ready to oversee justice. But the oath maker hadn't finished his gory business. The severed testicles of a sacrificed animal were then ground and squashed underfoot, a precursor of things to come. If he broke the oath, his own family would be emasculated. It was an ancient, unyielding custom. Whatever men first do wrong against the oath, let the brains of them and of their children flow to the ground like this wine, warns Homer's Iliad. All jurors swore to do their duty, a synthetic strap of common purpose. One Greek said, the oath is what holds the democracy together. And what a mongrel democracy this was. Farmers, old generals, cheesemakers, road builders, all manner of men would have been here to judge Socrates. All Athenian citizens over the age of 30, all chosen by lot. These were oaths taken in the presence of the gods themselves. Their ritual aspect was central. And so the fact that Socrates stands accused of a religious crime in a religious court should remind us 
of the fundamental seriousness of this particular legal day.